Welcome to Whiskey Lore. I'm Drew Hanish. Now, when I start putting together my shows, sometimes I will run into this little thing called serendipity. It's great how that works. I just get an idea in my head and somehow a solution comes up. And just such a thing happened to me recently when I was planning out these 12 days of whiskey lore. I have the two episodes that I'm doing with Chris Wimmer about Virginia City. And I thought, well, it'd be really cool if I could get some interviews in here from distillers who are either nearby Virginia City or have some relation to the Old West. So I got in contact with Colby and Ashley Frey from Frey Ranch, which is right outside of Virginia City, and I'm going to do an interview with them soon. But I also got an email without prompting from Colorado's 291 Distillery, and the question was put to me, would you like to have the distiller and owner, Michael Myers, on the show? Now, I'm not your normal whiskey podcaster because I don't tend to bring in guests from distilleries unless they're tied to my show in some way or another. So whether they're in the spirit of the show, something you know to that effect is what I'm looking for in guests. So I sent back a message and I said, well, I'm doing this series on the Old West. Do you think Michael has any knowledge about the old west and an interest maybe in that direction and the response was well he's a big fan of westerns and part of the reason he left new york as a fashion photographer was to move out west and catch that vibe and he's developed a whiskey that he wants to relate to the old west and be kind of in that personality and style so it turned out to be a really good match He's a great guy to talk with, and I I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. He sent me a couple of bottles. He sent me the rye whiskey, and he sent me their Colorado bourbon, and I am going to try both of those during the show. I'll give you my honest opinion of what I think about them. By the way, the bottles that they come in are gorgeous, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. He has a design background. He actually was a New York fashion photographer for 27 years, so when we get into branding and that sort of thing, he he's really all into that because that is his background. And we'll also start this interview off with him basically carrying his laptop around, giving me a tour of his current distillery. And there's a huge photo of a mountain that he showed me that is going to come up in our tour. We're going to talk about somehow that works into his equipment as we're looking around at the distillery. So listen out for that. And right now let's jump into the conversation and we're on a tour walking through Colorado's 291 Distillery. Uh, we left some corn, local uh, root shoot corn um, from Loveland, Colorado. Um, our uh, rye malt mm-hmm. comes from Germany, except for we do have some rye malt from root shoot. Okay. Um, when I started, the, the only rye malt was out of Germany or um, other parts of North America. And, um, I like the German rye malt and then they started malting some in Colorado. Mm. And so we've shifted to using some of that, but not for our bourbon and our rye yet, because we're just making sure that the flavor profile is still the same. Right. And then these are fresh bottles that came in. Um, and then this is our corn cooker, 1500 gallon, uh, Latina tank. I, had customized to be a cooker. Mm-hmm. It has a steam coil in it. So it's all steam powered by our new boiler. <laughs> ah. um, we move and we moved jan- in January and two months ago, the boiler went down. It uh. was a 29 year old boiler and I had to put a brand new one in for three months. So oh, man, I could tell by the way you said that, that there was a story behind that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Latina tank, um, mash ton corn cooker, 1500 gallons. We cook in about a thousand gallons, a little more, and then, um, cool it in there and we transfer it to our fermentation tank. Um, we pitch yeast for five days. It ferments or five to six 
once it's done in there, we transfer it to the stripping still and another Latina tank that I had customized into a stripping still. So those were all customized here in Colorado Springs. Um, the, the condenser is a Vendome condenser. I kind of stepped up to a big boy. Mm. Um, my homemade condenser couldn't handle 1,500 gallons uh. of boiling mash to cool it down fast enough. Right. It's our collection tank into, into our um, low wines. But um, so, 50, you know, 1,000 gallons um, stripped down to uh, 35% low wine. We get about 250 gallons at that point. And then we bring it over here into our finished still. Mm -hmm. And this still I had built here in the Springs. Um, the company that builds stills for me here are uh, DOD contractors. And they build things for nuclear subs and like like titanium ball valves, nickel press rings for propulsion tubes, yeah. things like that. Crazy okay. stuff. So they're like, we love whiskey. We'd love to build you a still. So <laughs> I gave them the plans of my original still this 45 gallon still and they mimic it and made it larger yeah so they're they're like twins it's like mini me next to uh next to exactly. the full size yeah so what's special about my original still is it's 45 gallons i designed and had it built myself um found a guy that could tig weld copper here, here in the springs um about 10 years ago and I took photogravure plates. So if you, right there, uh -huh. that's that rock and that mountain formation that oh, I showed you on that wow. photograph. Okay. Very cool. So there's seven plates on this still or six plates on this still, and they're all different photogravure plates. So they were at one point flat and had a chemical etch on them of a photograph. And then you put ink on it, you put a piece of paper with it, you run it through a press and you get an inked photograph. So I took six plates, seven plates. I have an extra column that um, is made out of one of the plates. And I had them um, water jet cut. Then I took them to a place and we rolled them through a metal roller. And then I took them to Al Novak and he, he TIG welded it together for me wow. and built my still. And it is now the thump keg of my um, large finish still. Okay. But the thump keg for this one, when I was in the 300 square foot space, was um, a, a five and 10 gallon barrel. Okay. The, chain, the size changed as my barrel size changed. But, um, and it, wor it worked really well. So what would, you, what would you say your difference is between the Irish triple distilled set up they have an intermediate still in between are you basically going through the same process um i think so it's three times distilled so the strip still the finish still and then the thump keg is a distillation as well okay um when i started this i really liked the um having a thump keg and i knew that i wanted to strip and so i, I realized it was a three times distilled whiskey so, okay. um, yeah. And that's from the beginning, like, so one of those, um, 55 gallon tanks was at one point, my mash ton, um, the coil has been cut out of it now, but my mash ton and it would, I would convert it. I had a top that was cut out, um, and had a six inch tri clamp top on it that would take the, um, column there's another column similar to the one on my finish still. I'm my thump keg there, mm -hmm. uh, original still. And it would go on there and I had a condenser and I would strip with that. Okay. And I could make about 60 gallons a month. I would mash in six, um, fermentations. So they were, uh, Pepsi plastic gallon, 55 gallon drums, um, that I'd do six of them. They'd ferment over a week. And then, um, I would strip and I could strip two a day. So take me three days to do that. Mm. I'd have about 45 gallons, which would finish out to be about 15 gallons finished. Wow. Um, so I could do it four times. It took uh, literally, uh, 15 hour days, seven days a week. <laughs> and, um, it was a lot of work, 
was a lot of work. Were you doing this 100% by yourself at that point? Yeah, sort of. I had somebody that was helping me every once in a while for a little bit, or somebody might come in and put some labels on, Yeah, but truly, and <laughs> making it and selling it, opening accounts, all that stuff. Um, but the, the best is um, everything was steam heated in that space. And I had my DSP, DSP CO, which is Colorado 15023. Mm -hmm. So I had my DSP in the space. Um, but the funny thing is I, I steam heated everything. And so I used a steam generator for a steam shower, home steam shower and had it all hooked up. And the first time I turned it on, I hit the button. I had already mashed, I had mashed in on a cookie fryer. So I already had a mash that was converted and I needed to strip it. So I was stripping it. And so when I, I hit the button, turned on, it started, you know, working really well. About an hour later, I heard a click and I went over the still. It was warm. I'm like, this is working. What happened? So I pushed the button on it and it came back on. I'm like, all right. And about an hour later, it clicked off again. And I'm like, damn it. It's a home steam unit. It has an automatic off. Uh, oh, man. So <laughs> for two and a half years, 15 hours a day, I reset that button every 45 minutes. Wow. So, and I'm not kidding. I mean, there's <laughs> many of people around here that I would sit at the bar and I'd be drinking after like 12 hours, having a cocktail, talking about whiskey or whatever. And I'd just get up and walk away from the bar. The bar was right next door <laughs> and everybody knew that I was going to push that button. Oh man. And that, and I would be right back. Oh, that's so that was, Yeah. So labor of love, I was going to say that's uh that's on a working scale, the same way, the same frustration I have with coffee makers that, you know, I'll put on a pot of coffee and I'll drink coffee for six hours out of that pot, but it keeps shutting off every two hours. So I have to keep going over and hit the button again. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, it's cold coffee. Yeah. yeah. How does a person who has not distilled whiskey in the past, and that now you have this idea that you're going to start a distillery. <laughs> Do you apply for your DSP or do you, do you do a little bit of on the side, um, testing to see if you can uh, actually make this thing work? Um, I had a, a friend, Mike Bristol, Bristol Brewing Company. I told him, you know, I was interested and he's like, get your license and I'll try and help. I can brew beer, but I don't understand distillation. And I said, okay, I'll figure it out. And, um, I reached out to Vendome for a spill. And they sent me, there's a picture, I forget, 50 gallon still um, for $50,000. And I was like, I can't afford that. Yeah. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know <laughs> if it's going to work. So that's what made me think I could build a still. I'm from Georgia. They make it in the woods. It can't be that hard. You know, I grew up on a farm. I'm an artist. I'm like, I can figure this out. I had 11 quarters of drafting, mechanical drafting in high school. I can mechanical draft to some extent. Um, you know, so I'm like, I'll figure it out. And I did. And um, I brewed, I came over to this space when Bristol was in here. And for one day, his head brewer kind of showed me how to brew and like temperatures and stuff. And I, and then I had read everything and, and Bill Owens had a book out about starting craft distilling and that you could, you know, pair with a, a brewery that could brew your wash. And then you just have to have the still. And I started down that road, um, in, in theory, and I just was ready to do it on my own. Um, like one weekend when I, when I, the still was being built and what, so I wanted to mash in on my own. So I went and bought corn, um, a hundred pound, uh, actually hundred pound bag of corn came from our 50 pound bag of corn came from Mike Bristol. And, um, he said, you can have this if you want it. And I went and got, um, malted rye from the home brew shop. And that is my first recipe was 80% corn, nine, uh, 20% malted rye and mashed in it came off the spill um actually this this one was on a little five liter emblem still right mm -hmm. that i had bought and i that's the only one one mash that i didn't do and that was the one test 
that I did. I mean, only one, the, in that still, that was the only mash I ran, you know, in that still was one time. And then I moved to my 45 gallon still that I had built. And that first run was September 11th, 2011. But, um, that is my bourbon. That is my bourbon recipe with one change. And the one change is I took out a percent of the malt rye and added a percent of malt barley. Um, but so the bourbon that you have sitting there is 80% corn, 19% malt rye, 1% malt barley. Okay. And that was my very first recipe. I, so I have, um, handwritten notes in notebooks of, of from day one. So I can prove it to anybody. If anybody's <laughs> like, yeah, right. I'm like, no, I literally, <laughs> and the notebooks are funny. Cause I, I, you know, whatever was going on outside of the distillery on that day, like my son running cross country or something, I wrote it in the, you know, in the margins. Oh, wow. Um, like, Oh, I got to go to cross country today or, you know, different things. So, um, it's actually really cool to go back and look at. I did the other day looking for, uh, something and, um, reading it, you know, there was a part in there where it was like, I had just got a pallet of bottles, which was like 1200 bottles. And I was at the point selling five cases. Um, so 12 pack cases, so more or less 10 six pack case a month. And I, I wrote in there, I'm like, that's a lot to go. Through. It's going to take me a long time to go through that pallet <laughs> and more or less about a year. Um, I've changed that quite a bit now, but so how did you come about, uh, your recipe first and then, um, was there ever a time when you went, let me experiment and see if maybe I should alter this or did you just, um, kind of roll with it and say, you know what, if it ain't broke, <laughs> don't fix it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the bourbon, I just felt that, um, originally the bourbon I started out to make a uh, 291 fresh, which is an unaged corn whiskey, um, to take the place of vodka, rum, or tequila in mixed drinks to have cash flow in a sense. The 80 20 was good, but I just felt it needed something on the end. And I thought the malt barley would help that. So that's why that has a percent of malt barley in there. The rye whiskey is 61% malt rye, 39% corn. Um, that is the second recipe. Um, <clears throat> It, it is, um, has not changed. Um, it's based loosely on Thomas Handy, which is a high corn rye, um, whiskey, uh, rye whiskey. So, um, it's like, I think Thomas Handy is somewhere around 60%, but it has malt bar, malt barley in it and mine does not. Okay. Um, but I, that was my favorite rye whiskey, um, before I made my own whiskey. Um, and then the, the third recipe, and that's what I was looking at the other day, actually, that's what I was reading or wanted to see, um, is 291 bad guy. And it's a four grain weeded bourbon. And the funny story about that is I was telling the restaurant that they could buy their own barrel. You know, I'd bottle it for them and it had their own label and it was a different recipe. And, you know, and so I had two restaurants take, that take me up on that. I told him, you know, the restaurateur to show, I, it would take me about six weeks to get a full barrel. And so I had experimented for the fresh and I did this four grain, you know, corn, 59 corn, 29, uh, malt wheat, um, nine malt rye and three malt barley. And I ran it and it came off and it was phenomenal white dog but it, it, it didn't have, it wasn't fresh. It wasn't 291 fresh. And so I'm like, this is really good. This has got way too much flavor for, for clean, fresh whiskey, you know? And, um, so I put it in a carboy and was going, doing my stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, it's been five weeks and I didn't make a new mash for that restaurant. And I'm, I need the cash cause I paid half up front. And, um, so I just called him up. I said, you know, I got a whiskey down here to put it in the barrel and, um, come down and hammer the bung. And so he did. And during that, he called his son and was like, you know, I'm putting whiskey in a barrel with friend. What, what should I call it? And his son, young 
three-year-old or something. Bad guy. <laughs> and I wrote bad, yeah, I wrote bad guy on the barrel. And a year later, because I'm aging in 10-gallon barrels, and a year later, it came to harvest, you know, and, or we need to do a cola first, so maybe not a full year. But um, I talked to him, and I'm like, so what are you going to call it? And he goes, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, you're not going to call it bad guy? He goes, no, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't really like that. Na-. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> you need to call it bad guy. <laughs> He's like. All right. I was going to say for you, you, uh, you're a fan of the old West. So it seems like bad guy is a very appropriate name for something that you would produce. And I live in Colorado. I mean, come on people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I make Colorado whiskey. So, so talk about this, this idea of Colorado whiskey, because I went to, um, I went to Texas and in Texas, they're really trying to, um, maybe unintentionally at first, but now it seems more intentional that they're trying to create something like Kentucky bourbon, Tennessee, uh, whiskey and Texas whiskey kind of has its own personality. Is that something that, that is kind of an intention for where Colorado is going with whiskey or is it just a name right now? And everybody's kind of wild West doing their own thing or. So, um, Colorado is interesting in that way. And with me, I did set out to make a Colorado Western whiskey. You know, um, I, I'm from Georgia, born and raised. We raised Tennessee walking horses. I had chickens when I was 12. My dad, it was a gentleman's farm. My dad had, you know, 70 head of black Angus and, and we had 40 head of horses on and off. Um, but we had a farm in Tennessee, which was seven miles from Jack Daniels, seven miles to George Dickel. Um, as well. And so, um, I wanted, I lived, I had the only Western saddle in our barn and I loved the West. I watched all the Westerns as a kid, you know, like at four and up. And, um, I just was like, I want to make a Western whiskey that, you know, a cowboy walks in the bar and give me a whiskey and the bartender just, you know, puts a bottle down, you know, and, 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 um, but what is that whiskey? Big, bold, beautiful. And I, you know, I'm not traditional, but I wanted to stick to tradition in a sense. And I love, I love Kentucky bourbon. I love Tennessee whiskey. Uh, Jeff Arnett, um, the past distiller of uh, Jack Daniels, he's now starting his own thing, I believe. Um, dear friend, um, you know, I, so Colorado, let's make Colorado whiskey what was already happening in Colorado because of the brew breweries, you know, that were 20, 25 years old in Colorado. Um, because of that industry, there were a lot of brewers that were looking to make whiskey. And, and one of them is like Stranahan's. And so they started making malt whiskey. And so, but nobody defined it. I think, I think Stranahan's was trying to define Colorado whiskey, but that's a hard thing to do legally right you you kind of have to make you kind of have to make you know like jack daniels kind of have to be making good whiskey for a long time <laughs> and, and have some it, in, it becomes, influence yeah you know, yeah absolutely yeah. so um there's there's for a while um nobody was really i mean peach street was making uh bourbon before stranahan's or about the same time they go back and forth about that about who was first um, so there was bourbon being made, but it was still not a lot of people making, and, and now there are a lot more distilleries making bourbon. Most of them were working around the, the malt barley style whiskey. Um, and, and I just, I, I was going down that route, like, cause of the Bill Owens book, you know, Mike Bristol could brew my wash. And, but I really coming from Georgia growing up on Jack, um, loving bourbon. I was like, I, I, I've got to also make American whiskey in that way. And to me, that was American whiskey where, um, malt barley is more scotch, you know, style or, or Irish whiskey. Um, so yeah. So I, and then I mashed in and that first, that first mash was good. And, um, and then my rye was great as well. The white dog was phenomenal. And I literally mashed in, distilled, and a month later went to a tasting at Stranahan's for the Distillers Guild of Colorado. 
And I actually met who's my distiller now then. And I hired him about three years after that. But, um, you know, I put my white dog up there and seven guys from Stranahan's came with, with the, um, uh, Rob Dietrich, their head distiller at the time. And they tasted my white dog and they're like, this is phenomenal. <laughs> and they're like, you should, you should put this in a bottle. And that's why I have two white whiskeys in a bottle uh. because of that. But, um, yeah. So, uh, it kind of was like, okay, I'm going down this American whiskey route. It, I kind of was pushed that way. Um, and, and love it. So, um, when did you decide to experiment and put, uh, Aspen staves, uh, now how are you doing the Aspen staves? First of all, are you, um, are you dropping them into, um, your barrels or how, how are you, um, marrying that influence into your whiskey? Yeah. So that's what these barrels are here. These are, um, single barrel, um, they we pop the bungs on them. We take toasted pieces of Aspen and we just put it in a couple of them in a barrel and they sit for about three weeks uh. and then we harvest it. So you have small batch right there, right? Yeah. Small yep. batch. Yep. So we, we've just started last January started, um, marrying, um, thank you. Started mar marrying barrels together for our small batch. Um, it was just too hard to, to harvest a 10 gallon barrel, excuse me, uh, harvest 10 gallon barrel, cut it to proof, you know, bottle proof and then bottle it. So we just efficiency as we grew as a company, um, we started batching and, um, we take about, excuse me, 20 mm -hmm. barrels, um, 20 barrels, a, a batch and we put them in a stainless tank and then we take these and these are a little small. They're usually a little bigger. And, um, we put them a bunch of them in the batch in the, in the stainless for about three weeks and then bottle it. So do you toast them? Is that what you do? Or do you char them? Yeah. We, we have a Weber grill in the back. Oh, nice. And we just grill them up. <laughs> <laughs> we did. I'm not, I'm not kidding. That's awesome. Uh, we ha I bought a Weber and, and we use, um, we use whiskey and other Aspen, fresh Aspen as the fire. So okay. we're getting, you know, the smoke and everything is still, uh, Aspen. It's not like we're using charcoal and then, and then, you know, toasting the Aspen over charcoal, um, with lighter fluid, you know, or grilling fluid. We, right. It's whiskey. We light it with and all like that. Okay. What do you think the Aspen does? to the whiskey because you've obviously tasted it before and tasted it after. What do you think it does to the whiskey? Yeah. So it's very slight what it does. Um, it, it pushes our, some of the caramel notes to maple, a little more maple note. They, um, add a little more spice to the whiskey and it adds a little more smoke. Okay. Um, people, it, it also adds an Aspen note to the whiskey. Um, and I only know that because people will taste my whiskey early on. Um, and they would just be like, you know, there's a, there's a note there that I can taste and I, it's really familiar and I don't understand it or whatever. And that was before, like they knew Aspen or whatever. And, and I'm like, are you from Colorado? Yeah, I grew up in Colorado. And they're like, I'm like, uh, <laughs> you ever been around the campfire? And they're like, Oh my God, Aspen campfire. And, uh... and they really, comes through, you know, I mean, differently, but for different people, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I wanted Aspen on the label. I was making Colorado whiskey. What's more Colorado right. than Aspen. And, and so I, I sticking to tradi tradition, you know, whiskeys are finished in oak barrels with wine or whatever. And I thought, well, why don't I finish it on Aspen? What's that like? And so I did one experiment, loved it. And here we are today. Very nice. So I had the pleasure actually last fall of planning a trip through the four corners and I drove through your area and I went down to Royal Gorge bridge and then down into Taos, New Mexico and across right in the middle of Aspen fall yellow. Oh, leaves. I mean, it was gorgeous. That entire drive. When you say Aspen, I immediately get this beautiful picture of, of Colorado in my mind. So it's a, it's gorgeous yeah. country around there. It is. 
really beautiful. So uh, should we dive in and uh, taste a couple of these and and see sure. what we got? Um, I, I'm I. I have, um, I was tasting already a little bit, but, um, <laughs> but I, I have the bourbon with me. I can probably get the rye if, um, but I, I know what it tastes like. Okay. We'll we can talk. We'll start with and the, uh, I like your questions more than me. <laughs> okay. And, um, talk about this bottle a little bit, because the first thing I'm going to say about this bottle, um, is I love the leather look of the label. And the shape of the of, you. of the bottle. I actually had these sitting up on the counter yesterday, and the sun was kind of poking through them, and just that nice dark whiskey color with just the elegant shape of that bottle, uh, and then the the semi rugged look of the uh, of the label on the front, um, and this nice little topper that you have here, which is uh, interesting. I'll have you explain. Um, it's like a little wire twist cage over the top of the cork. Um, how did you come up with, yeah. with that idea? So, um, yeah, uh, you hit all the fine points of what my bottle's about and what, um, what I set out to do. Um, <clears throat> so 291, uh, we'll start there, was the very first photo gallery ever in the world. Gallery 291, Alfred Stieglitz in, in um, New York uh, City, uh, 291 Fifth Avenue in 1907, somewhere in there. And, um, so my dorm room in college was 291. I was a freshman photo major found out about the distillery meant to be, uh, I mean, about the studio of uh, the gallery and meant to be a photographer. I have the key to this day. And, and, mm. um, and then when it came to this, the process of distillation and my still remind me of the dark room. So that's where 291 comes from. The writing on the label is my handwriting put uh -huh. into a font. Okay. Oh, that's so interesting. That is, that, that's actually how I write, um, <laughs> except for it's spaced out worse. And, you know, so I, I have it in a font where it can be kerned and fixed and stuff like that. But, um, and then you hit it on the nose. Uh, I worked out a pattern that is Xeroxed onto that paper um, to look like leather. And I spent time doing that. I design all my labels. Um, my art background is where all that comes from. And when I started out, I went for a bottle that's very similar to the Taylor whiskey bottle and, and Stranahan's uh, bottle. Okay. It's a very Western bottle, like mm -hmm. you right. But everybody had that bottle. And I, I really, I knew I couldn't afford to do my own bottle. And I knew... I literally bootstrapped this yeah. whole thing. So wow. I, I, you know, you got to buy 30,000 bottles and it's <laughs> back then it was a hundred grand. I'm like, yeah, no. um, so, um, I stuck with the strand of hands for a while or the, the Taylor bottle and it's a nice bottle, It is, but it wasn't as elegant as I wanted. And, um, Bruni glass. Um, I think it's Bruni. Somebody came to me with this bottle in a 700, and I was like, damn, that's so beautiful. And they're like, you know, you need to do a day's production. I'm like, how long is a day's, how many years day's production? They're like 30,000. <laughs> like, yeah, that'll be, that'll be a few years before I get that. Wow. Um, but I, I kept it and waited and got to a point. I think, I think we've been in this bottle three years. Um, and one day we could afford it and nice. we, called them up and they ship pallets and they ship pallets to us all the time. Um, and they're, I love that bottle. It's very feminine with a very masculine whiskey. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it's got really nice curves to it. It has that, uh, it's, it's tall statuesque. Um, but it, it does sort of remind me of a bottle you might see in a Western movie. You know, it's not quite as, quite as round. Those are usually, you know, this is, this is a square, uh, type shape. I, I, I sometimes, uh, it, when you say Jack Daniels, I think, um, does it, does a little bit of that square influence come from your, uh, growing up with, with Jack Daniels? Yeah. I mean, maybe, um, what the bottle remind like when I was just before I figured out that it cost a hundred grand to do your own bottle. Um, I had designed, I took a Macallan top and put it on another bottle. Um, I like the Macallan top. It's a little shorter. It's very similar to that, but it's a little shorter. Yeah. Um, and, and so when the, I was really attracted to this bottle because of that, because I had already 
gone through the steps of what I really wanted. Um, and so, yeah, this one just fit the bill and I love it. I love it to this day. Um, they drink my whiskey on Ozarks, uh, season three, episode three, and they don't ever really show the front label, uh-huh. but you know, it's my whiskey because of the shape <laughs> of the bottle. That's awesome. Yeah. If you, yeah. if you can accomplish that with it, with a bottle, that's, uh, that's great because actually I was watching a, uh, right when COVID hit, they were doing in Scotland, a online, um, quiz. And one of the parts of the quiz was they would show you the silhouette of a bottle and you had to guess what type of whiskey it was. And it really drew your attention to the fact that the shape of a bottle really does sometimes it, it's, it's, own, it is its own brand. Uh, and, and yep. it can really, well, Jack Daniels will tell you that, you know, they, uh, they saw a bourbon advertisement one time in Kentucky that had a square bottle on it and, uh, it didn't have a label on it or anything, but it was saying bourbon. And then it had the square bottle and they said, that's Jack Daniels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the square yeah. bottle is Jack Daniels. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, like maker's mark, you know what that bottle looks right. like. Right. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. without, without the wax on it, you know what that bottle looks yeah. like. Um, so yeah, so the cage and the cork, um, the K, uh, the cork, I wanted a natural cork. Um, I, you know, I started out with the traditional stopper cork that like scientists use or whatever, and those just didn't fit whatever or they fit for a while. But, and so then I, um, I went to, uh, have my own cork made and I designed the cork, um, and they, they matched it. And then just lately we've started branding the top of the cork. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a nice cork, but that is my design. I, I drew it up and everything. And, um, so it's awesome to be able to do that and have that. It's the only cork I've ever seen with a, with a beveled, um, you know, from the top of the bottle, uh, down to where the actual cork is that it's kind of beveled in. Yeah. The shaft. Yeah. So yeah, I wanted the bevel cause I wanted it to look like a, you know, a, a traditional stopper cork, mm-hmm. but to make it seal better and all like that, the shaft needed to be straight. And so that's why, that's why I designed it that way. Um, and then the cage, the cage is interesting. The cage is a champagne cage. Um, but, uh, when I was a kid watching, I thought watching Western movies, but I found out lately that it's not a Western movie that it was in, but it's a little house on the prairie episode. Oh, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Um, it, I think it's called the longest day and they are transporting nitroglycerin uh, in a wagon and it's a really hard day. You know, they're really sweating and all. And, um, the the nitro is in glass bottles and it's all wired into the to the wagon so that if there's any bounce it just kind of floats and doesn't jolt because that's it it'll blow up so when i was making high proof whiskey i'm like <laughs> you gotta wire it in somehow yeah. and so that's where the cage comes from wow oh that's really cool and and the the cage is it's interesting uh, my dear friend sam elliott pointed it out one night at dinner um, my mother drinks champagne and that's really all she drinks. Um, a little of my whiskey every once in a while, but champagne, since I was little, that's what she's drank. And, and Sam like was like the cage. Wow. Is, is that homage to your mother drinking champagne? And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, not really, but that's, it, you know, maybe subconsciously. And so. Since you've been out West, have you, have you bumped into, uh, any fun stories that you've heard or are there s- some really cool haunts that you've uh, bumped into out there that kind of have that old West feel to them, like bars uh, and, and restaurants, places to check out when you're out there? There's a couple, um, not many. It's, it's kind of interesting cause it is the West and um, I think things get remade and fall apart and people don't, um, protect them as much as you w- wish they would but there's a there's a bar and i it, it's weird because it's in such it's in silver plume colorado so it's on 70 going towards the mountains out of denver and there's a bar called the bread bar and it's this old um, bar i don't even know what it originally was maybe even a mill flour mm. mill um 
but somebody went in there and it was apothecary for a little while. And then somebody bought it from her and, and they turned it into a bar and it's open like Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, you know, and so I don't even know if it's open still now. <laughs> I haven't been there in a while. It's a great place to go. If they're open, it's this tiny town. It's awesome to drive through. I mean, literally it's, it's right off the highway. Um, and then there's a, you know, there's a few, um, the Stanley has an amazing whiskey bar, Stanley hotel in Estes park. Um, and it's an amazing hotel. Um, so there, you know, and then, uh, the Oxford hotel, downtown Denver is amazing. Um, there's some stuff in Telluride. Um, there's a great, uh, old, um, hot springs in Dunton hot springs. That's amazing. And Dolores is beautiful there and there's old buildings. And, um, so yeah, I, I try, you know, and there's a new bar, new hotel in Buena Vista on South main. That's very old West feeling. And it, it's really pretty and modern, but old West, not kitschy um called um the surf hotel that's amazing um i hope i haven't left anybody out that um, <laughs> sells a ton of my whiskey the surf sells a ton of my whiskey so yeah but um yeah um colorado i mean there and there's the oldest bar in colorado i haven't ever been there i've driven by the sign many times um you know and there's some funky little spots um but it's very gold miner esque yeah a lot of it you yeah. know so I was going to say, you're right on the edge of uh, Pikes Peak there. You're Colorado Springs, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, America's Mountain. Yes. Yeah. Um, Pikes Peak. And uh, yeah. And then there's Cripple Creek up there, uh, up on going up Cripple Creek. And there's gambling there. And, you know, it, it's, it's fun. It's a little kitschy, um, but it's fun. So um, you, have a, you have a whiskey that says pre-prohibition. I was checking your website out and you have one that says pre-prohibition. So I always like to, to um, get sort of an idea of what people consider to be pre-prohibition. Cause as I, as I started researching <laughs> whiskey history, pre-prohibition is the time period when they were having problems with uh, whiskey rectifiers doing all sorts of uh, things they shouldn't have been doing and barrels being, you know, people spitting tobacco in them to get color into them to show that they're aged, even though they aren't and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so whenever I hear some, <laughs> yeah, none of that. Yeah. 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 So you're not spitting tobacco in your, uh, in, in your, uh, <laughs> so, so, so what classifies as a, as a pre prohibition whiskey? So I have a dear friend, Nate Wyndham that was bartending, uh, in the restaurant next door to me when I started this and before I started it, and he's an amazing bartender. He's been bartending forever and he can make any cocktail traditional. He's, it, he's not great at you saying here, just make me something, make it up. Um, but traditional cocktail, he can put it, make it amazing. The best cocktail you ever had, uh, best Sazerac, best old fashioned tastes like sweet tea. Mm. Um, and, and we were talking and he has in incredible extensive knowledge from books he's found on Amazon or whatever old books, you know, and read about cocktails and all that. So, and whiskey. And so, um, we just came to the fact or, or he helped me come to the fact that, uh, a pre prohibition style whiskey would be something that wasn't aged very long because okay. it was put in a barrel just to be transported. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and then sold. So yeah, some of it got, was older, you know, because it stayed in the barrel as they were transporting it longer distances and stuff like that. But so that's what I went on. Um, and so it is 291 American whiskey. Um, <clears throat> it is the, it is the bourbon, uh, mash bill. So 80% corn, 20, 19% malt rye, 1% malt barley. We age it now in used 291 barrels, um, for somewhere around about five months. Um, and it, it just has a very, I call it my summer whiskey. I call it my training whiskey. It's 90 proof. It's really easy to drink. It's mm -hmm. really good, but it's different. It's not, you know, it doesn't have the deep caramel notes and, and the, you know, the, the spiciness of the rye or whatever. It, it, it's very, you know, different, um, but incredibly good. And, um, so I, it also came about for me with, um, 
Leopold's put out a, a small batch American whiskey um, that was light aged. Um, and, and I liked what they were doing. And so I wanted to experiment that way. And so that was probably one of my first experimentations with whiskey was, you know, just light aging it. Um, and I started out in like 30, 30 gallon barrel for, uh, three months or something like that. Not very long. So what is Colorado like in terms of weather? Cause I would imagine that you're probably don't have very long, hot summers, but how hot does it actually get? I mean, we talk about, if I were thinking about, it, I would think it'd be like, you've got Scotland in the, uh, except drier. Um, but, but kind of a, <laughs> a, a Scotland kind of a situation temperature wise, maybe in the summer where it doesn't get extremely hot, but then your winters are going to be really cold. You, you have, you haven't been to Colorado in the summer then. Um, we get, we get extremely hot. Do you? Okay. Um, we do. Um, I don't know how many days of the year, but we're at a hundred, 105, wow. um, a few days a year. We are 90 and up a lot of days in the summer. Um, long, the, the difference is, is with the mountains and stuff. Um, the evenings are usually cooler a lot cooler. So it's drastic shifts. So it can be, you know, it can be 90 degrees and then it'd be 75 at night, 70 with dry temperature, you know, no humidity. So it's, it's cool and feels good. And, and the other thing is those 90 degree days or those hundred degree days, um, are hot and you're standing in the sun and you're just sweating, but all you have to do is stand under a tree and your natural, you know, cooling of your body works Wow! because the sweat dries off yeah. and you, you cool. It's not like the South where I'm from, you know, Georgia, where, where you're just hot and you, it doesn't matter if you're in shade or not. It, it's just hot. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so we have a lot of swings and, and so, um, our barrels shift quite a bit because of that. Um, we are temperature controlled, meaning there is air conditioner in the building that we're in now and there is heat. Um, but I pretty much make it where we're, when we're working here, it's, you know, temperate. So it's 68 degrees about the guys in the back hate it because they're sweating because they're moving <laughs> around, but us right. up in front are a little chilly. Um, but it was really hot this summer for all of us. Um, so, but I let it at night drop or go hot. I, the air gets turned down or turned up or whatever yeah. so that it changes. So the barrels are moving. Um, but you age but, everything but right, yeah. right there on site then. Uh, yeah, well, we do have an offsite, um, warehouse at the moment. Okay. We grew out, we, we move in January. Um, we're going from 7,500 square feet to 12,000 square wow. feet with room to, to double another 12, 13,000 square feet which we'll take over in the next couple of years. Um, and most of that's for barrel storage. Um, so we grew out of this probably a, almost a year ago, um, and for storage and, and bottling and stuff. So we have an offsite storage, um, that's got about 2000 barrels in it right now. Okay. Um, and, wow. and we'll move January and then everything will be on the same on site. Isn't it time you nosed and tasted your whiskey like a master distiller? Enhance your whiskey experience with an elegantly branded Whiskey Lore Copita drinking glass. Find yours today at whiskey-lore.com slash shop. Just as a reminder, the whiskey samples in this episode were provided to me by the distillery for the purpose of experiencing the whiskey during our discussion. Any opinions are 100% my own. Well, I've been, I've been nosing your whiskey and I, and this, it's hard to believe that this is the bourbon because there is so much rye coming out of this for me. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's got, it's got kind of the, a sweet herbly kind of rye thing right out front yeah. on it. It's really interesting. And you said this is, this is yeah. nine, 19% malted rye. Do you think malted rye, um, has a different effect than just standard 
unmalted rye? I do. Um, it makes the whiskey sweeter in a different okay. way. Um, malt rye is a very sweet whiskey. Um, we are doing a hundred percent malt rye. It hasn't been released yet, but we have it in barrels. Um, it, and I learned that we do, we have an experimental label called the E label. Yeah. So, um, every batch is totally different, totally different recipe, things like that. And I did do uh, batch three was a hundred percent malt rye mm. and it's incredibly sweet. Um, like where there's original, like you just drop that in your mouth. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, so that's what I think malt, uh, rye does. I think, I think raw rye is a little, uh, or a lot spicier. Yeah. A lot of that also comes from the Aspen stave. Okay. It picks up the spice just a little bit. It's interesting because when I knows this, I think I'm a, I'm a scotch drinker also, and I love peated scotch and I think smoky peated scotch. And so when I hear the word smoky, I always think peat, but there's like a heat. It's almost like a perceived heat coming off of this whiskey. <laughs> that's, that's like a, it's a smoke experience. It's really, really yeah. interesting. Very different from, uh, from smoky, um, Isla whiskey would be just smoke, just barbecue, but not in the Texas way. You know, a lot of that Texas whiskey you're talking about, and I love Texas whiskey. A lot of my friends down there, um, iron root, um, uh, Jared at Bacconi's, uh, the Garrison brothers. Um, I, they're making good whiskey in Texas and, and it's a, definitely different, which I love. I love that. And that's the thing Jeff Arnett, you know, pointed out to me when I first met him, I met him at world whiskey awards. He won, uh, in 2017 distiller of the year from whiskey magazine. And I met him that night I was there because I, the year previous I had won America's best rye first time presented. And he, um, I introduced myself cause I live or had a family farm right at, uh, Lynchburg in flat Creek, Tennessee. And, um, we got talking and we're good friends. He's my age and nicest man on the planet. And, um, uh, so we, he talked about, uh, me naming it being Colorado whiskey and trying to help define what that was. And, and that's because he comes from Tennessee whiskey. And I understand that. And it was nice, you know, of him pointing that out and, and yeah just supporting that for me. So well, it's, yep. I, it's interesting because I just went to iron root and, uh, talked to Robert licorice down there awesome. and he Robert. was, yeah. And he's yep. taken me through and let me taste all these different things. And we talked for probably five hours. I mean, just as going through there and talking about his philosophy and then what they're doing and how they kind of talk back and forth with balcones and, and that whole kind of close knit relationship that those distillers all have down there. And that there are, there seems to be a commonality that maybe it comes from the yeast, maybe it comes from the corn, but there's something that sort of gives a Texas whiskey a certain personality, but they're all very different. They still, I, yeah. I, I told him, I said, the first time I tasted Balconies, I went, there's a, there's a funk to this and I don't know what it is. And then I tasted another Texas whiskey and I went, Ooh, that's interesting. That, that same funk is in there and iron root. I could taste a little bit of that same sort of person. It's like just this one little thing. And, and you know, from, uh, from branding that if you can find that one thing that maybe you don't necessarily, um, it's not obvious, but there's a perception. There's something you come up with. It's uh, back when I used to, was doing web design and uh, I used to say you always know a Microsoft product if you if you're around it because there's a commonality in the branding that's always there or target I can see a target commercial come on they don't have to put the logo up right. I can tell by the feel of it that it's a target right. commercial and so the same in whiskey if you can find that little subtle something that ties them all together or even in your own whiskey. And that's what Robert was talking about. He said, man, that's what I really look forward to is a day when people go, that's iron root. I just taste it. I know that's an iron root whiskey. Right. Right. You know, that says a lot. Yeah. And, and Kentucky bourbon, I mean, there's a note in Kentucky bourbon, you know, when it's Kentucky bourbon, you know, 
when you taste something that's been sourced and labeled, you know, some other state's whiskey, and it, it's been sourced from Kentucky or Indiana, you know, it, it's got a sweetness to it. It's got, it's just, I don't know what it is, but it, you know, it's made in that part of the country. Right. And, and like my, my Colorado whiskey is, is nothing like, um, Kentucky bourbon and it's big, bold, beautiful. It's got a, it's got a viscous mouthfeel. Um, so, you know, my, one of my things is rugged, refined, rebellious. Um, and that's who I am, what, you know, how I drive, how I do everything (laughs) in life. Um, the clothes I wear, I mean, I, you know, my fashion background, stuff like that. Um, but, and I think my whiskey really says that is rugged, refined and rebellious in all, all those ways. And, um, to be able to, you know, have your whiskey that way and, and hopefully the state starts, you know, wrapping itself around that and not tasting like Kentucky bourbon, because there's some, there's some people going and getting recipes or getting consultation from which you should from Kentucky but it, their whiskeys they're making tend to taste like mm. Kentucky. And, you know, if you're making in Utah or in Colorado or Texas, you want it to taste, you know, terroir in a sense right. um, from that, from that area. Um, and I think Texas does that really well. Um, Colorado is not cohesive as much with that, I think right now, but hopefully it, it will. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Well, it's, uh, you- Sometimes I think we try to push towards labels and because of familiarity. But the question is, if you do something that makes a whiskey better, but you can't put bourbon on it on the label because you did something that keeps it from being called bourbon, is that necessarily a bad thing? Um, no, I, I mean, you know, makers Mark kind of did that, you know, they have straight bourbon there. They're, um, makers 46 is um you know if you look at the label it says um straight kentucky bourbon finished or something and you know it's that extra finishing and so they have to say it the same with mine where it says colorado rye whiskey finished with aspen wood staves um you you know and when you do it straight it has to say that it doesn't it's not it's straight whiskey finished and right. you can't say, and that's all legal stuff, but, um, yeah, I mean, Tennessee whiskey is the same way, you right. know? um, but, but yeah, you want it to taste better, um, or consistency. Um, you just don't want to, you want to use grain, water and barrel, Yeah. you know, yeah. no coloring, no. no, no flavoring, nothing like that. Unless <laughs> you're making a flavored whiskey, that's a whole nother story, right. you know, but yeah. But I think, you know, Colorado has been interesting because like I said, uh, world whiskey awards, 2016, I won America's best rye whiskey. Um, and then, um, didn't win world's best in 2018. I won world's best, but I think in 2017 laws won, uh, world's best rye whiskey. And, and then, um, 20, I free 2019, they won it. I won it in 2018. They won it again. And then, um, I didn't win, uh, rye. I mean, I'm up like number four or something with the rye in 2020. Um, but there's something going on in Colorado with rye whiskey that we are winning those many, that many awards. Um, there's, there's something about altitude or something going on. And I think the same with, with Kentucky. I mean, with Texas, you know, Robert, and Balconies win those awards all the time with their bourbons. Um, and there's something going on. I mean, yeah. it's also that we're shaking it up. You know, we're making whiskey that's very different than what they're used to tasting. And so when that, when a nice whiskey shows up that doesn't taste like Kentucky, they're like, what's this? <laughs> that, what? That's pretty good. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Like anything I've ever tasted, but it's good. What's, so, it, yeah. what's interesting is that I'm a big fan of uh, Rubens. And so when I taste this, I'm thinking all I'm missing is the corned beef because it, it, <laughs> it really has the rye really stands out. It, I, you get, I was trying to put my finger on what exactly it is that I'm tasting. 
It's like when you bite into one of those caraway seeds in uh, while you're eating rye bread, that it seems like that whole experience is there. And I even had a little hint of what I would call like a Swiss cheese note. And I don't know if that just is, oh, wow. that I don't know if that's just coming through because my brain is saying, man, I really am craving a uh, a Reuben right now. <laughs> <A Reuben? laughs> I don't know. But. I love Reuben sandwiches. Yeah, I love Reubens. I mean, and I've. Um, just lately, a uh, year and a half ago, um, started being gluten free because my body is allergic to gluten. I learned, mm. um, and I love Rubens, so you know I can't <laughs> have that bread. But so what I do, and that gets rid of the rye, which is a shame. But I I take and have French fries, and then put all the insides of the Reuben on top of French fries, mm. and so. <laughs> That that helps satisfy it a little bit, and then a little rye whiskey along with it, and you know I'm good. But I mean, we our notes. Um, Eric Jett does most of our notes. Um, my distiller that I met long ago and started working for me about three years after I had started this, and um, he was I when I met him, I was like he's going to be my first hire, and he was, and uh, he makes all the whiskey now, and you know we consult each other and talk about stuff, and but he has an amazing palate. But he also has an amazing recall. Mm. So he can taste something, smell it, and he can name what he's taste like you just did with yeah. cheese and, yeah. you know, and the caraway seed. I mean, he's like that. He's like, mm, I smell, you know, I mean, we joke, he, one of his tasting notes on something was there's a hint of like a dusty poncho. <laughs> And we're just like, okay, you're talking dust and I wool love that. and heat, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah, and it wasn't a bad note, but it, you know, when you when you visualize that, yeah. you, you're like in New Mexico and this guy's riding up in a stinky <laughs> poncho, but, but but you know, with that, you've got to have a little bad with a little good, you know, right. you got to have a little of the dirt, like you talked about, a little of the funk, yeah, yeah, it's got to be there with well, the good it to gives, make good whiskey it gives it personality i mean what's interesting about this one is it the the rye is that um like i've had canadian ryes and i think canadian ryes probably hit too much on the maple side of things they're almost too sweet for me uh they some of mm -hmm. them lose that bite that i like in rye yours has the bite in in it but it's not an aggressive bite it's not like a black pepper hitting you in the in the face it it's just a nice a uh, little zing before it gets to the to the finish, but I was even getting like dark chocolate in there and maybe a little espresso yep. in there. Um, yep. It's really really interesting where that goes, and that's what I love is when you find a whiskey that actually tells multiple stories. You can drink it one day; it's gonna it's gonna say one thing. Whatever mood you're in, you're gonna pull out that particular flavor. Uh, and then the next day you're in another mood and you're going to pick out another, another flavor out of it. Yeah. So it, exactly. And I love that about whiskey too. And, and you, you spoke on this a little earlier, which is amazing. Um, that people don't know is, is whiskeys are like, like a good red wine Cabernet where, you know, you open that thing, pour it out and you let it open up, you mm. know, let it sit for 10, 20 minutes, maybe not that long. I mean, but still it's going to open up and, and a lot of that, um, just sometimes that ethanol will drift away. You know, um, all whiskeys are made of ethanol. So there is ethanol that you taste. And if you let it open up that, and all of a sudden the flavors just start coming out of it. And it's amazing. I love that about whiskey and people don't talk about that enough. And I also, when I'm tasting, you know, once I finish this, you know, I've got a lot in there and I, it's barrel proof that I'm drinking. So I'm not going <laughs> to down it, but <laughs> no, uh, I still have a work day. I still have a meeting <laughs> after this. Um, it, if I let the glass dry, you know, so finish the whiskey and for about 10 minutes, I will sit there and smell the glass. And throughout those 10 minutes, you will smell every note that mm. you ever taste in a whiskey. And you, at the end, the last note you will smell is tails, um, in every whiskey. And you can always smell the funk at the end. Wow. The funk is there. And, and I love to, you know, teach people that because a lot of times people taste and they're like, I don't taste, I taste cherry. 
right, that's what I got. Right, right. You know, or car- caramel. Yeah. I taste caramel. I, <laughs> uh, God, I hope you taste caramel. Yeah, yeah. We got a problem. But, but, um, but if you teach them that way, then, then they, you know, you get so many notes and people, and it just keeps changing every 30 seconds or so. And yeah. I love tasting whiskey that way. Um, so that's the first time I've ever heard somebody uh, actually talk about the whiskey changing in the glass as you're drinking it in, in Scotland. Uh, I, I was told, let the whiskey sit in the glass one minute for every year that it sat in the cask. And what's interesting is it really, if you have a 15 year old scotch and you put it in the glass and you let it sit 15 minutes, it really does change oh, yeah. a lot. And it feels, it feels like it's, it needs that time to settle in. I don't know if it's just maybe the, the weight of the whiskey is heavier at that time. So it, you know, the calculation is, is that it's going to take a little longer for those oils to settle in or, or what that, uh, philosophy is. Well, yeah, well, they make, they make old whiskey there. So, you know, um, <laughs> it's six to 15 minutes. And, and so I, I would say more, you know, let, at least let a whiskey sit in a glass for five minutes, 10 minutes before you ever drink it. Um, because it's going to open up. It's just going to, and if you don't believe me, you know, put, you know, there's not a lot of whiskey. That's a little more, maybe half that amount in a glass, set it next to your bedside. Um, and in the morning it will have, well, at least in Colorado, it will evaporate to it's dry. And, you know, and it, I mean, so if that much water is being evaporated out of it, you're just condensing the flavors and, and the air oxidizes and it just really makes the whiskey better. It, mm. I mean, it can, it can go too far. You know, you can wake up, do this much and you wake up and there's half that much in there and you drink it and you're like, Ooh, <laughs> that's a bomb of wood. Yeah. I don't want that, you know, but you can always add a little bit of water back and drink it. And it, it, it's still good. You know, I mean, it's probably less alcohol and stuff like that. But um. I was going to say the other thing I bump into every once in a while is uh, a whiskey. Uh, I have a bottle of uh, Abelauer, uh 12 year. I bought at Christmas time and I, I opened it. I tasted it. I had gone to the distillery and loved the whiskey, tasted it from the bottle. I'm like, are we just not getting the good stuff over here in the States or, or what's the deal? And, uh, that's been in my cabinet for almost a year now. And when I taste it now, I love it. Oh yeah. Uh, something has happened to that whiskey in that, that year that it's been, and that, you know, I know the aging process really stops, but ox- oxidization, um, maybe the whiskey having time to settle down in the bottle after air hits it for the first time. I don't know what that is. And, and, and maybe your memory just kind of, you know, of, of that time changed as well. Right. And I'm not, right. I'm, Absolutely. you know, I mean, those kind of things happen, you know, and I learned that early on, I went to Europe, um, in college for summer, you know, summer school. And, and there were times we had bad experiences, right. You know, somebody got robbed or whatever. And it, it, we had a great experience, you know, year later, two years later, three, five years later, we never remember the bad experience. It's just like, wow, remember Italy? We should go back. You know? <laughs> um, right. Right. <laughs> you, you, Absolutely. Your brain's really funny about bad experiences. Yeah. It kind of gets rid of them and only remembers the good stuff. But, um, yeah, we, I was going to say that earlier. Um, we don't mash in every day yet. Um, but when we're mashing in, we try not to taste whiskey because, the smells and stuff going on really changes your palate, really changes what you're tasting. So, you know, and, and Jim Murray's, um, really famous about that. Like he, he hibernates in his house. He doesn't cook when he tastes, he like for weeks, months, he doesn't do anything in his house. And, you know, he won't let anybody come to his house because he's worried somebody's going to have some cologne on or something like that and, <laughs> and change his, his palate. Right. But it's true. I mean, you, yeah. you can be, you, your, your house smells a certain way. And, and, and I, the best way to do this is take a bourbon and eat, eat tortilla chips and then drink your bourbon. Cause they're all corn Yeah, and you won't taste any corn notes. <laughs> in that bourbon and that bourbon will taste totally different. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. The first time I did that, I was like, what? 
you know, but yeah, I mean, things influence your palate big time. I, I had somebody, so. I had bought a bottle of, uh, Akintosh 12, which is triple distilled, uh, oh, yeah. in the, in the Irish tradition. Uh, but is a scotch whiskey and I loved it until it got to the finish. It was like this toffee, uh, caramel. And then all of a sudden it went to this citrus, really heavy lemon citrus note. And it just clashed for mm. me for some reason. And somebody said, um, well, go get some lemon juice, put a little bit, bit on your, uh, on your finger, dab some on your tongue. Now drink the whiskey see what happens. I'm like, no lemon at the end. This is great. It's like, you. I don't know if it's changing your brain or if it, what it is, but for whatever is occurring there, it's a really cool technique to get that flavor that you're not liking or that you want to avoid and uh, taste something that has it, at least has an influence of it, and then come back and uh, you know drink, right. drink the whiskey you, you want to enjoy. And Akintoshin. I love Akintoshin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love them. Good stuff. So. Well, um, all right. So I have to ask this question before I let you go. What is, since you love uh, the old West and wild West, what is your favorite Western movie? Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's not a traditional Western movie. Okay. Uh, my favorite movie. I'm not sure if, this movie, because I'm a very visual person, this is a movie and I don't know if the visual in the movie inspired my vision or I just related to my vision. Um, but it is, um, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, Clint Eastwood, ah. Michael Cimino's first movie. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Bridges, or that was one Brid of his first movies. Bridges. Yep. Jeff Bridges is on fire when he steals that Camaro. I mean, he is the best Jeff Bridges ever. Um, you know, that movie, I saw it. I literally saw it when it came into the theaters. My mom took me because she lived in California. I was visiting her and she's like, I'm supposed to go to this movie. You're coming. And I mean, I, I think I was seven years old. I'm, I'm not kidding, wow. but that movie really, uh, I love that movie. Um, it's classic. It is classic Clint Eastwood it, and it's very Western, but modern, yeah, um, yeah. or at least at that time was modern. Um, and then my favorite actor at all, uh, Sam Elliott, who oh, okay. I met 30 years ago, um, has been, is a dear friend. Uh, Catherine Ross is his wife. She is, uh, my wife, my mother's soul sister. Um, they are best friends. We've been friends, family friends for, 30 years he drinks uh my bourbon on the ranch which is amazing <laughs> the netflix nice. show the ranch yeah yeah um he's a dear friend uh, i'm i might be in california this weekend and if i am i will have dinner with him which i'm excited about um so well i have to ask you this question then because uh i was in radio for for a long time and i remember the first time i ever walked up to somebody who had really deep pipes as, as we like to say in radio, he just had that really resonant kind of voice that when he talked to you, you felt like you were feeling him talking in your chest. Is Sam Elliott that way? Because he has that really deep voice. Does he kind of resonate around uh, the room? Um, his voice is very distinct mm -hmm. and, and uh, very beautiful. Um, but it's not he doesn't talk loud. Okay. Okay. Um, he, he's very, he's a very humble man. Yeah. He's a very incredible person. Um, incredibly talented. And, um, but <laughs> you know, when he turns and goes, Hey, Michael, I mean, it's Sam <laughs> Elliott when he says it and right. he's just like, Oh my God. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like being you know, buds with and, Morgan and, Freeman turns around and says something to you. You're like, Whoa. Yeah, I mean, you're just talking. It's, <laughs> it's Sam, but he, it, it's Sam. He's a dear friend and Catherine Ross, amazing woman. Amazing. They're amazing people. Amazing couple. I love them to death. And, uh, they've been very good to me and my family. And, but yeah, um, he's been really good to me. So where, uh, because I haven't seen 291 in my local stores here in South Carolina, how, how much of the nation are you covering at this point? So we are not in South Carolina. We are in 12 states, 
maybe 13 soon. We might open Georgia before the end of the year. Hopefully that's my home state. Um, but if you go on 291.com, 291 Colorado whiskey.com, um, distillery 291.com, both those, um, you can order and it's through the three tier, but, um, so you can order, uh, all our, our flagship whiskeys. You can't order special releases or our E, um, but you can order them and they'll be delivered to your door. Um, and they cover 43 states. So there are some states that we can't deliver okay. to through okay. bar cart. Um, but, but that's the latest that's just been launched over the last couple of weeks. Um, but if you're in, uh, let's see if I can name them, California, uh, Oregon, um, let's see, Colorado, um, Wisconsin, Illinois, um, Kentucky, Texas, uh, Florida, New York, um, DC, Virginia, um, somewhere else. Um, <laughs> you can, you can talk to your local liquor store. Most of those States, uh, Kentucky and, and Texas are the distribution is RNDC. Um, the other States that are not, uh, controlled States are through LibDib liberation distribution. They're really great, but you can talk to your store and they'll bring us in. Um, Perfect. So, but the easiest way is our e-commerce on our own site. Um, it goes through a three third party vendor that ships it direct to your door. Perfect. It may take a week or two to get it, but yeah. Yeah. It's worth the wait. Yeah. It's worth the wait. Thank Good you. Stuff. Good stuff. Well, excellent. Well, I thank you so much. Thank you. Hopefully we'll meet in person soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a traveler, so I got to see those Aspen trees again. Yeah, good. I'm a traveler too. So awesome. <laughs> All right, Drew, take right. care. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed that extended conversation with Michael Myers of 291 Distillery. And I've got more deep dives coming up. And also our next Virginia City episode will be coming up soon. So make sure to keep checking your feed during these 12 days of whiskey lore. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC. Research and production by Drew Hanish. For information, transcripts, and show notes, head to whiskey-lore.com slash episodes. And until next time, cheers and slonjava. Help support an independent podcaster. Head to whiskey-lore.com slash Patreon.